So welcome to the 75th anniversary of NASA Ames Research Center and to the Director's Colloquial Summer Series. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is freedom. The only things that you truly own is what you learn and your relationships with the world. So knowledge is the greatest gift you can give and receive. The Khan Academy makes knowledge accessible to everyone. Knowledge that will change their lives of, and the world. Today's talk is entitled Khan Academy, Education Reimagined, and will be presented by Simon Khan. Mr. Khan is the founder of the Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing free, high-quality education for anyone, anywhere in the world. He graduated from MIT with two Bachelor of Science degrees, one in mathematics and one in electrical engineering and computer science, and a Master's of Science degree in electrical engineering. He also holds a Master's of Business Administration from Harvard Business School. For his work, Salmon has received many prestigious awards and honors. Please join me in welcoming Salmon Khan. Thanks so much. So very, very exciting to be here. I, I always like to start these, uh, the, these, these conversations really just getting a sense of, of who's in the room. Uh, how many of y'all are, 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 are users of Khan Academy in some? Oh, good, yes. How many of y'all, how many of those are, are, are existing students? Okay, how many of y'all are in high school? Okay, oh, there's a good crowd here. How many of y'all in college? Oh, wow. Uh, grad school? A few, okay, very, this is. A middle or elementary? Any? Any here? Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. Oh, look out there. Very good. And how many of y'all are parents who? Okay. And how many of you have no idea what Khan Academy is? Good. I'm going to be talking to you today. Very, very good. So, um, as uh, as it sounds like most of y'all are, are probably familiar, Khan Academy is is often associated with uh, a collection of videos that I started making uh, now, you know, a, a decent number of years ago. But as we're going to talk about over the course of this, uh, this this conversation, is it's now much, much, much more than than just videos. In fact, in my mind, the videos are are, are a small part of, of what Khan Academy is and what it's what it's going to be. But to get everyone on the same page, and especially for the gentleman who doesn't isn't familiar with Khan Academy, I, I will show a quick montage of of uh, videos. All of these interactions are just through the gravity. This is an age right after Isaac Newton. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. And you can just see the pleasure he had. Can you determine which light bulb is being switched? The things actually can interbreed, although for these two in particular, it seems like the mechanics would get kind of difficult. <laughs> Keep playing around with these numbers and see what kind of colors I can come up with. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. <laughs> I had a feeling this crowd would appreciate Euler's identity. But as I mentioned, it's not just uh, videos. This right over here, this is our, co our computer science uh, platform. It's a place uh, where you can go, you can code, and, and, our, and our whole goal here is, you know, for all of us who've ever programmed, we always got into it saying, hey, I want to create a game, I want to create a screensaver, I want to create an animation, and then we just learned what it takes to build that animation, which isn't how it's traditionally taught. Traditionally, it's like, hey, this is a for loop, this is a variable. And so we really wanted to give that, that, create, that creative spirit uh, that, that I think all programmers originally got into it for uh, to, to the learner, and they can have profiles, and they can build, and they can, they can get peer, peer feedback based on what they're doing. This is what most of our team is, is focused on. I, I guess you could call this the meat of Khan Academy. It's our, it's our interactive math experience. And the idea here is a student can go, log on, they'll take a diagnostic, and all this is free, it's all available. Um, and, and based on how the student's performing, it'll build a statistical model of what they know and don't know. And then based on that, guide them through exercises, give them feedback. Uh, if they have a, a teacher or a parent, it can give the teacher or the parent reports on how they're doing, and obviously a whole series of game mechanics to, to hopefully keep the students as, as motivated as possible. 
So this is where we are right now. Uh, uh, Khan Academy is being used in some uh, way, shape, or form in, in almost every country on the planet. Uh, about over 300,000 educators have registered and are using it in some way. Uh, 10 million unique students every month are using, uh, are using the site, and they've done over 2 billion exercises. And you saw a little sample of what those exercises look like. Uh, but before kind of going more into where we're going, I, I will take a step back, and I, and I get a sense that, that many of y'all are familiar with this, but I'll give a little bit of a, a, a little bit of texture of how all of this got started. Uh, and it's exciting to speak here because it all got started, frankly, not, not too far from here. Uh, if you rewind to uh, summer of 2004, so almost exactly 10 years ago, I was a year out of business school. I had just gotten married, and uh, I, I was based in Boston at the time. And I had a bunch of family visiting me from New Orleans. That's where I was born and raised as well. And it just came out of conversation that one of my cousins, Nadia, her mom told me that Nadia was having trouble uh, with math. And so when Nadia came into the room, I asked her what's going on. She said, well, I took a, you know, I've been a decent student. I've been getting B pluses, A minuses, but there was a placement exam at the end of sixth grade and it had unit conversion on it, you know, ounces to gallons, miles to kilometers. And according to Nadia, she just, you know, couldn't process it. She's just not good at unit conversion. And so I told her, look, I think you could easily overcome that. I think she thought it was kind of an empty pep talk. So I said, no, no, seriously, well, if you're up for it, how about when you go back to New Orleans, we'll get on the phone and whatever else we can use, and I'll, I'll tutor you. And she was up for it. So uh, she went back, and so starting August of 2004, every day after school for her, every day after work for me, got on the phone. We eventually figured out a way to see each other's scrawls on uh, Yahoo, Yahoo Instant Messenger had a little doodle functionality at the time. And so we just started working. And you know, the first month was tough. She essentially had psyched herself out. She had convinced herself that she's just not good at math. But slowly but surely, she started to engage. She started to really kind of own and tackle the problems. And then something clicked. And, and she not only got unit conversion, she started to actually get a little bit ahead of the curve of where you would expect a seventh grade student to be. And at that point, I became what I call a tiger cousin. So I called up her school and I said, you know, I really think Nadia Rahman should retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? <laughs> and I, and I pointed out that I'm, I'm her cousin. Um, and, 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 and somewhat surprisingly, they did allow her to retake the placement exam. And she went from being placed, tracked into the remedial class to not just the, the average class, but, but into the advanced class. And, uh, you know, and I could go on and on about Nadia. I mean, that same Nadia, just to fast forward a little bit, who, you know, at age 12 thought she couldn't get unit conversion, by age 14 was taking calculus at the University of New Orleans. And that's something that we just, you know, and, and I've seen off more and more the more that, that Khan Academy's grown. But, but as, as rewind back to fall of 2004, I was excited. It was this kind of very small thing that I did with my cousin. It seemed to really help her out. So I started working with her younger brothers. Uh, then a few things happened over the next two years. Uh, the first is I, I was a, an analyst at a, a, small, uh, a small investment firm, and uh, very small, it was, it was me, my boss, and his dog. And um, <laughs> the, the dog was the chief economist. And we, uh, we actually had cards printed. And, and his wife, uh, the, my boss's wife, not the, uh, uh, be, be, became uh, a professor at Stanford Law School. So we moved the firm out here. Um, and. Uh, so I was now based out here uh, in Palo Alto and then moved to Mountain View. And uh, the other thing that had happened is word got around in the family that free tutoring was going on. <laughs> so uh, I was working every day after work with about 10 or 15 cousins, family, friends, uh, all, over, all over the country. And to, to help scale that up a little bit, you know, I was working with, even when I was working with Nadia, but then especially as I started working with more and more cousins, I saw that even the ones that were pretty good students, they all had gaps in their knowledge. And, it, it, and, I, and I wanted them to be able to practice more and for me as their tutor to see what they knew and what they didn't know. So I started writing a little, uh, a quizzing uh, piece of software, a web-based thing that would generate problems for them as they mastered one concept, it would move them on to the next one. And that was actually the, the genesis of Khan Academy. It was literally, I, re I remember the day, I was like, oh, what do I call this thing? Um, and I looked for like five or six domain names, couldn't, you know, all of them were taken. And I'm like, what about Khan Academy? And it was available. Um, and, and, but at that time, it had nothing to do with videos. But then you fast forward to fall of 2006. I was at a dinner party up right here in San Mateo. And uh, you know, I was showing this software off to, to a bunch of my friends. And, um, 
And they all knew I had this crazy project with my, with my cousins. And uh, the host, uh, I give him full credit, Zuli Ramzan, he says, well, you know, Sal, this is, this is cool and everything, but how are you actually scaling up your actual tutorials? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm actually having trouble with that. When, you know, what I was able to do one-on-one -on -one with Nadia, I can't do when there's five people on the phone. Or sometimes I cover something with one cousin, and then the next week I'm covering it again with another cousin, and I wish somehow that they were, they were there for the first time. And so Zuli says, well, look, you know, I've got an idea. Why don't you make some of your tutorials as videos and upload them onto YouTube for your cousins? And I, I immediately said, no, that's, that's a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano. <laughs> it is not for serious mathematics. But I, I went home that weekend, got over the idea that it wasn't my idea, and I, uh, <laughs> and I decided to give it a shot. And so I made those first few videos on least common multiple, adding fractions with unlike denominator, just topics that I saw a lot of my cousins were having questions about. And I, you know, after I made about 20 or 30 of them over the next month, I started telling my cousins, well, you know, why don't you watch these for a review, and then when we get on the phone, you can dig deeper, and then based on that, I could even make more videos based on what questions I'm getting. And after about a month of them, I asked for their feedback, and they somewhat famously and backhandedly told me that they like me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> And, and, you know, I think, I think that, and that, that, and that is true, and, but I think it's, it, it bears, it's worth parsing what they were saying and what they weren't saying. They weren't saying that they didn't appreciate having me in their life, taking interest, being there to answer their questions, to mentor them, to coach them. They, I, I believe, did appreciate that. But what they, what they were saying is, is that the first time you're learning something, and we've all experienced this, it's actually really stressful. And the last thing you need is even a, a well-wisher waiting for you to understand it. Do you get this yet? You're afraid that you're going to waste their time. If you're in ninth grade and you forgot a little bit of your fifth grade decimals, you're embarrassed. You don't want to admit it, even to a well-wisher. But now with the videos, no one's going to judge them. They can access it whenever, wherever, repeat as much as necessary. So I just kept going. I, I made more and more and more videos. And then it soon became clear that people who were not my cousins were watching. And, <laughs> And maybe even a few. Actually, who here was, was uh, watched as early as like 2007? Any, anyone? Okay, there's a few. So y'all are not my cousins. That's, um, so so uh, y'all were some of the, the early adopters of it. But, um, and, and, you know, it was neat for me to just see the, the viewership grow. But then people started writing comments below the videos. And some of the comments were just a, a simple thank you. And even that was a big deal. I don't know how much time y'all spend on YouTube. Most of the comments are not thank you. They are... <laughs> They are somewhat edgier. Than, uh. but, 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 then, but then, you know, people, I started to get, hey, I passed my algebra exam because of this video. Or this is a video after retiring from the military, I'm able to go back to college and re-engage in mathematics. I remember this was either, two, I think it was mid-2007, I got a, 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 an e, a kind of a YouTube message from a mother, and I brought my wife over to read it. It was really incredible. She said her, her sons had a learning disability. They were falling behind. And these videos were the only things that were allowing them to, to keep up with their class. And because of that, her and her entire family were praying for me and my entire family every night. <laughs> and you got to imagine what a strange feeling that was. I was an analyst at a hedge fund. <laughs> I wasn't used to people praying for me. It was very, very... Uh, so, so, at least in that way. And so, I, I, so, so I, I just kept going. And then you fast forward to, to 2009. You know, the viewership kept growing and growing and growing. Uh, uh, by fall of 2009, I frankly had trouble focusing on my day job. And, uh, you know, we, my wife and I, we had a little bit of savings, uh, essentially to, for a down payment on a house. And, uh, but, you know, she saw that this is where my mind was. This is where my passion was. I started, you know, we got a little bit of a of press. And, and I said, well, you know, it feels like there's something real here. I set it up as a not-for-profit. And, you know, I think whenever, when you do anything entrepreneurial, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, you almost have to start from a somewhat delusionally optimistic point of view. And, and for me, it was like, you know, look, the, the social return on investment here is off the charts. You know, just me, I can do this, but if I could have some more people to help me, we could build out the software, we could reach more and more people in the world. And so I was like, surely someone will, will fund this. And, you know, so I quit my job. This was uh, August of 2009. And like most entrepreneurial stories, it doesn't necessarily work out the way you planned. And so those first few months, I, pro you know, I probably had conversations with on the order of 20, 30 foundations and, and different groups. And it, there was a lot of, hey, this is really interesting, but it's not quite what we do. It's kind of a strange not-for-profit where it's, you know, one guy essentially making videos at, the, at that point in time. 
And, and you fast forward to May of 2010, now nine months have passed. Um, I'm starting to get pretty paranoid about this. My uh, son had been born, our expenses had grown, we had just started renting a house uh, here in Mountain View. Um, and I was questioning, you know, what, what have I done? I gave up a really good career. Um, I even in some weak points started updating my resume. And, uh, and I was getting some donations. I was getting, you know, there were five, $10 donations. They were amounting to about, you know, about $100, $200 a month. If it was any of you, thank you. Um, uh, but but it obviously, we were still digging into savings. But then May of 2010, all of a sudden, a $10,000 donation comes in. So I see who it is. Her name's Ann Doer. She's based in Palo Alto. Uh, so I immediately email her back. And I said, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. This is the largest donation that Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, you would now have a building named after you. <laughs> Which is, I think, quite inexpensive. And uh, Anne immediately emails back. She's like, well, I'm local. Uh, I've, I've been using your site myself. I've been using it with my daughters. I'd love to meet and, and find out more about what you're doing. And so I think it was two or three days later, we met in downtown Palo Alto on University Ave at an Indian buffet restaurant. And over lunch, Anne asks me, so what's your, what's your goal here? And I told her, you know, when you fill out the paperwork to be a not-for-profit with the IRS, they, there's a part of the form that says mission, colon, and there's like a line and a half. And I filled out a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And Anne said, well, that's ambitious. <laughs> How do you see yourself doing that? And I told her, no, no, this is, a, this is a mission statement. I don't expect to just check it off tomorrow and then move on to healthcare or something. <laughs> but I think we can make a lot of progress here. And so I showed her, I had a big stack of these letters and testimonials that people were sending. I showed her the, the viewership from the videos. I had all these screenshots from the, uh, the software that I had been, and I was still working on, uh, for my cousins, the teacher toolkit. It had been used at a sub couple of summer camps in, in this area. And so Anne says, you know, you've been able to do a, a, a surprising amount uh, with, it seems like, very little resources. I, I have one question. How are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. <laughs> and so Anne kind of processes that, and, and we, we part ways. And 10 minutes later, I'm driving into my driveway here in Mountain View, and I get a text message, and it's from Anne. And it says, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. So that was a good day. <laughs> and, and frankly, it just got you know, the, the crazier and crazier series of events. Uh, about a month later, this is uh, summer of 2010, I was running a little summer camp in Portola Valley at a middle school, uh, very small, it was me and a friend. We were, and it was really around this idea of, hey, I'm this virtual guy, you can get lectures on demand now, what could you now do with a physical classroom? I never viewed this virtual stuff as somehow being a replacement, I always viewed it as liberating the physical classroom. And so the summer camp was a way to experiment with that, and we had kids doing dialogue and simulations and making projects. And we were in the middle of one, it was a bunch of middle school students, it was a simulation that I came up with, we had six kids playing a game of Risk, while the other 20 traded securities based on the outcome of the game of Risk. It's a good game. And, and, and while that was happening, all of a sudden I start getting text messages from Anne, which you could imagine I now take very seriously. <laughs> and, and, so, and it was actually hard to read because they were disjoint and it wasn't clear which, which came before which, but they read along the lines of, uh, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, Colorado. I'm in the main pavilion. Uh, Bill Gates is on stage, last five minutes talking about Khan Academy. So I didn't know what to make of this, so I immediately boot the nearest seventh grader off of a computer, <laughs> and I start looking for some evidence of this event that, that Ann is talking about. And it took about 20 minutes, and I did eventually find the footage. It was literally uh, Walter Isaacson, head of the Aspen Institute, on stage with Bill Gates, and, and he asks Bill, I call him Bill now, <laughs> He, he asks Bill, uh, what are you excited about? And he just randomly starts going, well, there's a site, Khan Academy. I, I use it with my kids. I use it myself. And he went on and on and on about it. I mean, he clearly spent a significant amount of time with the site. And, and you could imagine how I felt. You know, at first, this just felt like a dream. This was surreal. Um, but then the, the very next impulse, I actually became really nervous. I, those videos were for Nadia, <laughs> not, not Bill Gates. And, and, and frankly, I, didn't, you know, I, 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 I went home that evening, I told my wife about it, a couple of my friends heard about it, as, you know, they, they emailed me or called me, and then I, I, it was, I was confused, I, you know, what do I do now? What, what's the protocol? Do I call him? I, you know, I'm guessing he's not listed. 
And, and they, they left me in that, that limbo for about two weeks. Two weeks later, I'm, I'm in my walk-in closet about to record a video, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and cell phone rings, and it's a Seattle number. And I answer it. Uh, hello? Hi, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. Uh, you might have heard that Bill's a fan. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> And if you're free in, in the next few, few days or weeks, uh, we'd love to fly you up to Seattle and find out more about how we might, we might be able to work together or potentially support what you're doing. And I was looking at my calendar for, for the month, completely blank. <laughs> and I said, yeah, maybe next Wednesday I have to cut my nails, maybe do some laundry, but I think I can, I think I can meet Bill Gates. Um, and, and so we had uh, the meeting, um, and it was actually very similar to the meeting with Anne. Uh, and then right around the same time, some folks from Google reached out, and I've tried to see if there was any connection, but these were all independent events. Some folks from Google reached out, and they said, hey, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the team here has been using Khan Academy with our children, and we love the site. Um, we'd love to think about you know, what you could do if you had more resources. So you know, what, would you do if you, if you had, if, what would you do if you had $2 million? And, and I said, you know, is this an open question? We could say, <laughs> buy new pants or something. No, no. But I, very, very similar to, to that conversation. So all of a sudden, 2010, um, it all, you know, all the stars aligned, and the Gates Foundation and Google were the first uh, to kind of really allow Khan Academy to become a real organization, uh, so that we could start hiring our, our first, uh, the beginnings of our team, and then, and then get office space, et cetera, et cetera. And what we immediately started, I guess you could say, investing in or working on was uh, the interactive math part of Khan Academy. And what you see here, this is what we call our knowledge map. And it's no longer a primary navigation interface on Khan Academy. It was back when it was being used for my cousins. But it's still there. But we, I like to show this because it, it shows how we think about mathematics. So each of those circles there are a concept in math. And the ones at the top are basic mathematics. They're things like basic arithmetic, 1 plus 1 equals 2. And as you go further and further down, it goes all the way to, to, to college level statistics and calculus. And our goal is to just keep going on and on and on. And eventually into other subjects as well. You saw the videos are much broader than, than just math. And the idea is once a student shows mastery in a basic concept, it then moves them on to a more advanced concept. And those lines show that, that dependency. And at some level, that's common sense. That's the way you would play a video game. You, beat, you keep trying on level one until you beat the level one boss, and you go to level two. It's the way you would learn a martial art. You keep practicing the white belt skills, and only once you've mastered white belt and you, you pass the test, then you become a yellow belt. But what, what, what we always point out, this is not the way that a traditional school model is architected. A traditional school model, you group students together, usually by age, and then later by age and, and perceived ability, but usually by age. And then you move them together at a set pace. And what happens is, uh, in, normally in class, most of it is the teacher lecturing. And then students go home, they do homework. Then the next day, you review homework a little bit, maybe get a little bit more lecture. Then you go back, do a little more homework. And then that cycle, homework, lecture, homework, lecture, homework, lecture, continues for about two or three weeks. And then you have an exam. And let's say that exam, let's say the unit that we were working on was basic exponents. And on that exam, let's say I get a 75%, you get a 90%, you get a 60%. And even though the exam identified those gaps, you know, cleared the person who got the 60%, didn't know 40% of the material, even though it identified it, even the A student who didn't know 5% or 10% of the material, even though the assessment identified those gaps, the whole class then moves on to the next concept, something that probably builds on those gaps, say negative exponents or logarithms. And to, to put in perspective on some level how, how absurd this is, imagine if we did other things in our life that way, say home building. <laughs> So you bring, the, you bring the contractor in, and you say, well, we've been told we have three weeks to build a foundation. Do what you can. <laughs> so the contractor does what they can. Maybe it rains. Maybe the supplies don't show up. Maybe some of the workers fall sick. And after three weeks, you get the inspector. The inspector comes and says, well, you know, the concrete's still wet around there. That part's not quite up to code. I'll give it an 80%. So great, that's a B minus or C plus. Let's build the first floor. Same process. Contractor, we have another three weeks. Do what you can. After three weeks, inspector comes. Hey, that's a 90%. OK, great. Let's build the second floor. And you keep doing that third floor, fourth floor. And then all of a sudden, while you're building the fourth floor, the whole thing collapses. And the reaction that people tend to have, or if we have the same reaction that people often have in education, they said, oh, maybe it was a bad contractor. Or maybe we needed better, better inspection or, or more inspection. And who knows? Maybe that had some part to do with it. But the real thing that is going on is that the process was absurd. 
You were artificially constraining how long you had to work on something, pretty much ensuring a variable outcome, pretty much ensuring you're going to have gaps. Then you take the trouble of identifying those gaps, but once you've identified them, you just completely ignore them, and then you, you move on. And so what we say, instead of holding fixed how long and when you learn something, and pretty much ensuring a variable outcome, A, B, C, D, F, do it the other way around. Hold fixed that every student should master basic exponents, should get to that A level, and then the constraint that gets loosened, the variable constraint, is when and how long they get to learn the material. Right when we started, uh, some local school districts, uh, Los Altos especially, but then uh, shortly after Mountain View and other local school districts, and then many around the country and world actually, uh, started saying, well, how could we use Khan Academy in a classroom? And you know, our point of view is, well, it, this could free up this whole one pace fits all. You could have every student learning at their own pace, mastering concepts. You know, we had already had some dashboards for teachers, and we were working on more. And the idea, and this is, this is kind of, we, we started seeing this behavior by observing these classrooms, is that you know, it, even though every student's learning at their own pace, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, an isolated kind of learning experience. In fact, it became more interactive, where you know, this dashboard that we have for teachers kind of encapsulates how a classroom could run where each of these columns are one of those concepts that you saw on the knowledge map. Each of the, these rows are a student in the class. And then the depth of, the depth of, of blue is a system's a sense of how well the student understands it. And the red students are flagged that this student seems stuck. And so as a teacher, I could walk in and I could say, oh, look, there's a, a lot of the students seem fine with square roots of perfect squares, but there's a couple of students who are having trouble with solid geometry. Either I could do a very focused intervention with those students while letting every other student learn at their own pace, or even better, I can get some of the peers to help each other. Maybe there's some of the students who've mastered it already. They'll get the added benefit of you learn it even deeper when, when, you, when you explain it. This is some data from a, a, a local charter school up in Oakland, California. And you know, this, this is, you know, and I'll, I'll caveat this, you know, I don't want to give anyone the sense that you can just drop Khan Academy into a, a classroom and all of a sudden the butterflies will fly and the flowers will bloom. It's, it's a tool. And like all tools, it's going to be as good as, 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 as how it's being used. And you know, the credit to what I'm about to talk to is really the bulk of it goes to the teaching staff, especially their head teacher, Peter McIntosh. But what was exciting, you know, this, was a, uh, this is a ninth grade algebra classroom. Uh, it's a charter school in Oakland, California. They're getting students from the local school district. Many of these students, two, three, four years behind grade level. Some of these students didn't know their multiplication tables, didn't know basic arithmetic. And what, what happened here is, you know, this is something that Peter McIntosh always believed, is that the way to address that is to let these students, even if they're in algebra, make sure that they have that strong foundation. And, and try to get them to own their own learning, set their own goals, learn at their own pace. And he was just looking for a tool to allow him to do that. And so this classroom, and actually even the year before even the slide, in 2010, this classroom was in the 22nd percentile in the state of California amongst ninth grade algebra classrooms. And then this past year, they were just in the 99th percentile in the state of California amongst ninth grade algebra classrooms. I think there's only nine classrooms in the state that outperformed them. And, 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 and what's been neat about this, I mean, obviously, you know, everyone always talks about test scores, and clearly the test scores were good. But what, what Peter mentions is, look, the test scores, that's all nice, and math learning is nice, but he views that as really a pretext, that the more powerful thing that happened is, these were students who came in disengaged, thinking that they weren't good at math, like my cousin, like Nadia, and they were very passive. Hey, teacher, tell me how to do it. What do I have to do? Do I have to memorize that for the exam? They would look at a problem for five seconds and say, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm not good at math. But by, by allowing them to move at their own pace and by allowing them to set their own goals and really sh uh, kind of showing them that mastery is important, it's not enough to just superficially understand something, it gave them ownership over their own learning. And when you gave them ownership over their own learning, it changed their mindsets for the rest of their life. That, that, that ownership is probably a more important skill than any of the algebra. And that pays dividends not just in the other classes, but, but obviously as you go into careers and, and, and whatever else. Now, everything that I've, I've talked about so far has been, um, has been uh, kind of, uh, well, uh, this has been the, the classroom environment. Uh, but obviously, out of the 10 million students, not all of them are in classrooms. In fact, 9 million are just independent learners. And this next video is a good example of, of just how much potential there is out there if we just let people tap into it. So I actually uh, dropped out of high school twice, um, both during my freshman year. Um, and when I eventually came back, I was put in sort of lower level math and science classes because I was so behind. Um, 
then I discovered Khan Academy. Um, and I was able to skip two years worth of math just through using the site. And I came into school, I took the exam with students who had been enrolled in the class all year, and I was actually able to get the highest or the second highest scores in the class. Um, so for me, Khan Academy really changed the trajectory of my entire life. Um, because without it, I don't think I ever really would have been inspired to, to learn and to love math and to love science. Um, I ended up graduating as a valedictorian and going on to Princeton, where I'm now a computer science major, and I'm absolutely passionate about learning, about computers, about math, about science. Um, and without Khan Academy, I don't think that these things would really matter to me the way that they do today. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to everyone at Khan Academy, Saul and the team. Um, please keep doing the good work that you're doing because you're really changing lives. So. So this, this just actually got even more interesting. So when we found out that Charlie is a computer science major, we said, you know, we have internships. <laughs> And so he interviewed for the internships, and he did very well in the internships, actually so well that a couple of people who interviewed said, like, who is this guy? You know, he's really just rocking all, all the rounds of the interviews. And I said, you know, why, why are you surprised? We educated him. <laughs> but he, he actually got offered, accepted the interview, and now he's interning with us this summer, and he's actually here. So, yeah, we want to stand up. Actually, uh, Charlie, you want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually the first time that I'm like, wait, Charlie's in the room. I should, like, I'm always, uh, actually, I, I, actually, I, I, all the people at Khan Academy, why don't you stand up, just so everyone, we have a bunch of interns and new folks that we all invited, so, as you can. I, as you can tell, I always like to pack the audience with friendly people so that I can <laughs> maximize the, uh, So this is something that some of y'all might have heard about. Uh, College Board, makers of the SAT, about two months ago, announced that they're going to create a new SAT in 2016 that's more aligned with what students actually learn in school and is more correlated with being prepared for college. Uh, but as part of that, they, they finally recognize what everyone has always recognized for, for many decades now, is that there's been this perceived and maybe actual inequity in preparing for these types of high stakes tests. That you have this whole multi-billion dollar industry around test prep that the middle class and upper middle class can afford, but the people who need it the most can't. And so they decided, they've never done anything like this, to partner with us to create a free test prep. And, and what's exciting about this for on both sides of, of the relationship is, you know, the, the reason why they partnered with us is because they, didn't, they wanted to do test prep on a much deeper level. That it's historically been associated with familiarity with the exam, here's some test taking strategies, here's how you guess, here's how you cram. But they recognize that we're not about that. Uh, you know, we're, we're literally about building your foundations, mastering concepts, not somehow covering your superficial weaknesses. And so what, what we're going to be building together, and it's a very, very close relationship, is you know, not just free test prep, but literally the best test prep that happens to be free, and not just about familiarity with the exam or what do you do in the week or two before the exam, but wherever you are, however you start, whatever age you are, we can get you to whatever knowledge state that, that you want to get to. We have also have uh, a partnership with NASA, which I thought would be fun to mention here. This is, uh, so there's a whole series of content uh, on, on Khan Academy now, uh, simulations and videos on, you know, I, you know, I had done a whole series on cosmology uh, even before, but now we have some real NASA content on, you know, how do, you know mission to Mars, how do you figure out how far a star, away, a star is and, and things like that. So there's a, there's a you know, very, very exciting uh, partnership, obviously, and to some degree, I mean, I was just speaking to, to, to the folks here, uh, you know, NASA's mission is, you know, it's obviously about exploring space, uh, but it's also about educating, especially in STEM, to make sure that we have the, the talent so that we can, we can explore space. So everything I've talked about so far has been the world that most of us live in, the English-speaking world, the developed world. Uh, many of y'all might be thinking, well, you know, what about the rest of the planet? Maybe they could even benefit more from something like this. And you know, as early as 2007, 
Uh, there were folks taking Khan Academy in on D, you know, the videos or sometimes even the software uh, and taking them all over the world on thumb drives and sometimes on computers and so maybe sometimes setting up broadband. And, and all of these are pictures of those other groups, other not-for-profits, other NGOs, sometimes governments, uh, taking Khan Academy out to the world. So these are all kids using Khan Academy in random places. And they're each pretty incredible stories, but probably the most incredible one is the, is the one on the top right. You know, I, I used to give talks like this and joke that, you know, maybe one day this will be used in Mongolia, just imagining the furthest place on the planet. And then a few months later, I get a letter from Mongolia. <laughs> and it's the young woman on the top right, her name's Zaya. And you know, she had, a, she had a, a, an email and then a, a link to a video. And, and her video was very similar to Charlie's, saying how she liked Khan Academy. It really helped her in math. And, and it, was a, it was a cool video, but I immediately assumed that she must be middle class or upper middle class. Her English was quite good. She had access to the, the internet and a computer. But then I read the text of the email more carefully. And it turned out that there was a group of engineers from Cisco Systems that were using their vacation time to go to Mongolia and set up computer labs with broadband in orphanages. And so what you see in the, the top right there, those are the actual orphan girls using Khan Academy. And Zaya was, was, was one of those orphan girls. And that by itself was like you know, something out of a science fiction book, but it got even more incredible because Zaya then went on to become one of the top contributors of content in the Mongolian language. And so it's, you know, I guess it's, it's very similar to Charlie's story that you know, hopefully she benefited and then she's able to contribute to, to help the next generation of, of learners here. We're actively to be able to reach more and more people around the world, translating the whole platform, not just the videos, but the exercises, the dashboards, everything, to the world's major languages. This is the Spanish version of Khan Academy, which we launched uh, in this past fall. We've recently launched Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, we're launching soon Turkish and French. And our goal over time is to do all of the world's major languages. And to get a, a feeling for what some of this, at least the video content, feels like in other languages, I'll show you this next video. Me comí dos cuartos de pizza. L'hypoténuse commune, ok. Si, je san, je ouah. Or mes hats is block ko dhakel le ki koshish karna is direction me. Tu jad qit atayin min madini nihaz wa zink. Pi, or be tawane dos arb tare. Eke ani kudash ba shoka siyum shal azafit khot ekhet maagala ikhida. Ili mweze kwelewa na kweza. Indo kalik funaga siyaz kukuba. On alt, böyle on alt, bire eşittir. Muitas e muitas e muitas outras coisas importantes. I'm Zaya from Mongolia. Your videos are so interesting and funny. Make more lessons. I watch that whenever I get lazy. <laughs> So these are just more pictures of Khan Academy. I mean, we, we get sent these almost every day of pictures all over the world of, of people uh, using Khan Academy. Um, and you know what, what I always tell folks, I tell this to the team almost on a weekly basis. I tell it to our supporters. I tell it to all our stakeholders. And, and once again, you, know, you saw some of our team were now, you know, even this summer, we're 60 full-time people and 20-something uh, interns. Uh, we've had hundreds, actually thousands of people help volunteer in terms of uh, help subtitle and go out into the field. Obviously, there's hundreds of thousands of teachers part of this. And what I tell everyone who's, who's kind of involved or, or, or not involved even is that you, know, you hear the term once-in-a-lifetime opportunity a lot. But in, in my mind, it's, it's much more than that. It's actually much closer to a, a once in a millennium opportunity, where uh, you know, we're clearly at this inflection point in history, uh, probably one that's uh, bigger than the printing press, bigger than the Industrial Revolution, and probably would rival the advent of writing or the advent of, of agriculture. And whenever you have these new inflection points, it raises new problems, but also new opportunities. And to, take it, to, to solve those problems, it also it kind of brings about new institutions. And it was kind of a delusional dream when I was a guy operating on a closet here in, in Mountain View. Uh, but now it seems a little bit less delusional that our hope is that Khan Academy can be an institution that over the next decade, 50 years, you know, 100 years, 500 years, can, can take this thing called education and uh, you know, this thing that's fundamentally been scarce, has fundamentally been the determinant between uh, those who succeed and those who don't, and, and make it more ubiquitous, like clean drinking water and, and shelter, and really just a, a fundamental human right. Thank you.
So we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and when you get it, stand up. Thank you. I have a question back here, Saul. Oh. Hello? Hi. Oh, yes. Saul. So I have a question about the disconnect between what we're teaching people mm -hmm. and what, we act, what people actually do in the real world. Yeah. And so one of the restrictions, as I'm sure you well know, is that we have to have things that we can measure when we're in mm. school. So we have this sort of monetary, how do you decide if you've succeeded or failed? But when you go into the real world, it's quite a different story, and you well know that, right? Yeah. And depending on your profession, you have to have some very different tools. And many times it's social tools rather than the kind of educational tools that we learn in our schools. I'm sure you're well aware of this, and I just wanted to hear you speak about it. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, um, you know, the, the, way, the way I think about it, and I've, I've written a little bit about this in, in, in my book, is, um, you know, education is this huge spectrum of things that, you know, at this, at this end right over here, I guess you could think of your most rote things. This is your multiplication tables and your grammar and your vocabulary. And then as you go further and further in this direction, it becomes more and more open-ended. This is creativity. This is um, communication skills. This is dealing with complexity. This, and... And you know, for better or for worse, pro probably because exactly the reason you point out, because of its measurability, the the traditional system has been focused right here. It's been you know not just on road things; it's done some more open-ended things. But it's for the most part this spectrum right over here, kind of squeezing out time for for some of the stuff that might be even more important, but it's very hard to measure. And so you know, when we envision what what the school of the future should look like is you tackle a lot of what I would call your foundational, your core learning. And even there, I, I agree, it's completely up for debate. Should you be learning calculus instead of statistics? Should you be learning uh, you know, civics and law? It's not part of the, the traditional curriculum. But that core foundation, you can get more efficiently through, through something like, through something like a, a, a Khan Academy, learning at your own pace, learning at your own time. But what the goal is, is it really should free up most of the class day most of your learning experience to be focused on uh, being able to you know, deal, you know, work on a project, do Socratic dialogue, uh, dealing with complexity, whatever it might be. And frankly, those are the things that I think people should be evaluated on. You know, where are you? And, and if, in my mind, what the credential of the future is going to look like, and I mean, the reality is it's already the credential of today. It's just never been recognized. Yes, your test scores and stuff, they're, you know, they're a measure of your critical thinking skills and your reading comprehension skills and whatever else. But that's only one part of, of who you are. The more important parts are your portfolio of work that you've created. So you know, right now, if you're an architect or designer, they walk around with a portfolio. I think, in fact, I think that is already true of almost any career. I've told you know, some of my cousins who are now uh, you know, in college, I said, look, you know, get good grades, have a, get a good degree, but the work you create, document it, because that's going to impress people more. Even when we're hiring at Khan Academy, we're more impressed if we can see people's work. And then the other aspect is peer feedback. Um, what did your peers think of you? What did your leaders think of you? What did your subordinates think of you uh, when, when they worked with you? So I, I completely agree. that. that the hope is not to just kind of get into this reductionist, you know, core skills world, but to let, but if we can tackle that more efficiently to, to, to broaden how we evaluate people. So if I have a follow-on question that directly relates to what you just said, um, you're going international, which means totally cross-cultural, yeah. and you're creating an international, a global perspective on what constitutes an educated person. Have you been looking into the cultures of Mongolia and all of Asia, which are long established cultures, yeah. and considering the implications culturally? And I don't mean on a religious sense. I yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, so you know, I think the general, the general idea is, you know, the good thing is math is not that, you know, different from, you know, obviously they might use different notation, different words for things, but there, there's a lot of agreement. There's not a lot. It does become more of an issue as we go into subjective subjects, especially history. Um, and we even, you know, I, I did a, a few years ago, there was an article that came out about, you know, the CIA literally published documents about the, the, their, their intervention in, in Chile, uh, to kind of with the Allende regime. And I thought this was fascinating. I thought, well, this, is, this would make a good video. So I literally went to the primary documents, talked about it, uh, uploaded.
downloaded it, uh, trying to be as objective as possible, but telling people, look, you know, everyone's got a bias, so be skeptical. And immediately, a lot of Americans who said, hey, this was a good video. Some said, oh, you could have been a little bit, you know, it's a Cold War. You could have been given a little bit more credit to the, the context. But then some Chilean students came on and said, you are an imperialist pig. You have whitewashed history. Uh, my uncle died in that intervention. This is what actually happened. And my initial reaction was like, wow, you know, this didn't happen on the algebra videos. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and it also didn't happen in the history classes that I was a part of growing up. But then the question is, well, why didn't it happen in the history classes? Because in a, in, a you know, in a traditional history class, you know, a room like this, the professor says what they say, and people take notes, and they kind of feed it back to, to, to the professor on the exam. And, and so I, I think one of, the beauty, one of the beautiful things about the internet is how, how, how transparent it is. And you can't get away with extreme bias because someone's going to call you on that. With that said, I think it's going to be, especially history, um, it's, you know, there's a whole set of kind of hot button issues throughout the world that we're, you know, we don't want to, over the long term, we definitely don't want to shy away from them because we think people should, you know, this will help the world if more people are just aware of, but we want to do it in an objective and in as, as kind of a um, respectful way as possible. Um, I'm a fairly new parent. I have a two and a half year old daughter, and uh, she's uh, she loves YouTube and on the iPad. And we have to d dole it out as a reward for certain things to her uh, to get her to eat and do other yes. things. <laughs> so screen time is a big issue uh, uh, for parents. Uh, and it, and then I, it dawned on me why, why am I uh, hooking her into YouTube? I should be now uh, hooking her into Khan Academy. Um, and, You're a uh, tiger dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to hear any stories of uh, of the youngest. Uh, kids who are using Khan Academy and, and w w what age they uh, they start off, and then also uh, if you yourself have kids and and if you just tell them hey go and uh, <laughs> yes go get help from the internet with your homework yes so uh, I do have kids I have a five year old a three year old and a negative three month old uh, a few people will take oh, no. it's not hard to do anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, the the uh, so so I mean so my, my view on on screen time I mean you know, a lot of people ask me about this and it's actually it was funny I was once in a, uh, in a in a meeting of kind of these ed leaders and Bill Gates was there and you know a bunch of people started going on the whole screen time issue and they're like is it healthy for kids to just stare at something you know even if they're learning a lot is it just healthy for them to stare at it for you know an hour at a time and you know, if they're and, and then and then Bill Gates I mean I don't know if he meant to be funny but he says you mean like a book. And, and, and they're like, oh, that's a good point. You know? but, but, um, but, but I think there's a real thing there. Like, I mean, I, I, and for me, I don't think of it from like, what is the limit? How, what, you know, what's the maximum time or minimum time or thing like that? I think of it much more of like, if it's, what, what is, it, as long as the kid is getting the other important aspects of their life, then things are good. If they're spending a couple of hours a day outside getting to run around, if they are getting a couple of hours a day interacting with peers, of, you know, or maybe they're same age or above and below a little bit, if they're getting several hours a day where they're having quality time with a parent, just playing and imagining and doing things, um, th th then, then, th you know, then I think it's fine. It's, 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 but if, if, but if, if they have no screen time, but they also don't get to go outside and they don't get quality time, then I think it's, you know, that's, that's the worst of, of, of all the worlds. So I think that's the, um, you know, as long as they get a broad mix. And once again, you know, when we imagine what the schools of the future look like, and when we see the best implementations, the kids are outside more than they were in kind of a non-technology enabled world. They're interacting with each other more than they did in a traditional classroom where they were kind of just, you know, listening and, and taking notes. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, youngest, I mean, you know, I would say right now, Khan Academy, it, it definitely, we've seen it resonate well with kind of mid to late elementary school. Uh, we've just launched some early learning content. I will say that, you know, it's still leveraging the interface of the stuff that's being used by middle school students and high school students, so it's not perfect. Um, and we are, you know, we've just brought on some incredible people to really uh, think about it in, in kind of a mobile environment, because obviously, especially for, uh, you know, folks your daughter's age, um, you know, but every now and then I've, I've encountered, you know, a parent who's, you know, has a five-year-old or something who, who uses it. But, I mean, that makes me insecure, because my son wasn't on it. And, you know, and anyway, I, I, I'm trying not to project too much. We were at, actually in a, a, at Whole Foods the other day, and someone recognized me, and me and my son, he likes taking rides in elevators, so we were like on our fifth ride. And, <laughs> And someone said, oh, Khan Academy. He's like, is this your son? I was like, yeah, this is my son. He's like, oh, you must be so good at math. What's four plus three? And he's like, six? Like, oh, no. Oh, no. So, yeah, so I don't know. I think I, I'm going to have my own set of issues to deal with. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, oh, yeah, yeah all the way mind. back. Oh, yeah. um, I was wondering if there were any plans uh, for Khan Academy to be adding uh, curriculum to learn new languages. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, the simple answer is no. I mean, it's interesting. We were just chatting to some of the Duolingo folks. I don't know if you all are familiar. I mean, they're, they're, they're a great app for learning languages. Um, but no, we don't. I mean, I, you know, I got ideas for, for um, uh, language learning. And I mean, I'll tell you some of my crazy ideas is, you know, setting up Skype buddies with, you know, kids of different ages. I, I, I might try to set it up for my kids in, in the near future, uh, where, you know, a kid in India or a kid in Mexico, where they spend some time in English, some time in, in, in the other language and try to solve problems together. I've even thought that, you know, the best foreign language instruction, and it actually, in fact, it definitely would be more economical, would, you know, just send them to a country for a month. Um, and they will come back having known the language. So, um, so yes, but no, we, we aren't probably going to do foreign language anytime soon. Yes. Hi, so uh, I spent a lot of time like you with um, you know, MIT engineers and, and NASA engineers, and there's a large percentage of uh, people in that population who fit the following uh, description, which is they're, they're really good at math and things like writing essays and writing stories, they're you know, not so great. So, so I actually signed up um, on Khan Academy a few months ago and was looking for a writing course. Mm. Didn't find one, so I thought, well, I had a range of responses. You know, one, one end, I'm thinking, maybe that's too challenging or there's something unique about it and they just haven't gotten to it yet. And the other end of the spectrum, I'm thinking, well, maybe for some careers, you know, writing isn't that important. Oh, well, no. Well, I, I mean, I, I, put up, I put writing up there. I mean, if, you know, like that's the enabler of, you know, almost everything. And I mean, I think there's a tragedy out there, too. And I mean, I agree. A lot of people who are strong in math and science kind of think writing isn't for them. And then you have people on the other side who are strong writers who think math and science isn't for them. And it's a tragedy because, if anything, I've seen that this, it's the same exact muscles you use. It's the ability to think clearly, to structure your thought, to, to, to be logical. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I actually think if people allow themselves to think this way, uh, the, peop the very same people who are excellent writers can be amazing mathematicians and vice versa. And, you know, I, always, I see kind of a, there's a corollary there where I see people who's like, oh, I'm not into math and science. I consider myself a creative person. And that kills me, too, because as we all know, math and science is, you know, especially engineering, it's all about creating things that never existed before. And I think some of this dichotomy happens because, you know, early on in, in our education, we, we uh, evaluate students, uh, you know, with these, with these tests, you know, at, at third grade. How well can you multiply these two numbers? Have you memorized your multiplication tables well? And we evaluate and we give them, you know, we give them a grade. And that grade isn't like, oh, you knew 80%, let's keep working on it so you get 100%. That grade is, you, got, you knew 80%, you are a C student. You are mediocre. Just remember that. You're mediocre. And, and what that does is, uh, oh, oh, I mean, uh, uh, well, I, I, just, I just lost my, lost my train of thought with the whole, all, all the, uh, what, what we were talking about? Writing. Oh, writing. Yeah, we were I, completely <laughs> lost I was really good, too, what I was about to say. Anyway, I'll, I'm going to remember it in like 30 seconds, but I just had a complete... Yes, but 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 anyway, the the the, the oh no, I remember. We, we, <laughs> to, that that what what that is is that that's like that's like that's like evaluating artists based on how well they mix paint, or it's like evaluating a dancer based on how flexible they are at age eight. And so I, I think there could be a lot that could be done on the writing side. I think a lot of people have a fear of writing. It, they had a teacher at some point that was very, hey, you misspelled that word. And, and they lost the creative side of like, hey, just write. Write what you're thinking. Write freely. Write what your, 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 your argument. And likewise, a lot of people get turned off of math and science. They got dinged. Hey, you're not good at this or that, even though they would love to build things and create things. Uh, in terms of kind of the writing, I mean, it is something that one day we will want to do on Khan Academy. I think it's actually going to be something closer to our computer science platform where you have these projects, you can create them, you can publish them, they're in your profile, and they're in essentially your portfolio, and then the rest of the community can give you feedback on how you did, and so you can keep iterating and, and, and making them better. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, I mentor Mount View High School robotics team, and one of the biggest challenges I have as a mentor for these kids, these high school kids, I'm an engineer, at, engineer here at NASA, is getting them to, to commit to doing it, to, to uh, you know, go read stuff outside of someone handing it to him and all that. And you were showing the young fella here this video. I was thinking he was one of those kids, maybe worse so than the ones I'm with. And then he engaged and he committed to learn and he followed through and he's done exceptionally well. The ones that I mentor that do that, commit and go on, uh, do really well. The, the biggest challenge I have is to getting them to commit. Yeah. 
What, what do you have on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's no simple answer there. I mean, I def there's, um, I, you know, I, I will cite, there's all this, you know, and this is something we talk a lot about in our, in our own uh, at Khan Academy. There's all this research around mindsets, around, you know, the growth mindset. And how many are familiar with this idea of a growth mindset? Any, okay, a few folks. So there's a researcher, Carol Dweck at Stanford. Uh, her whole research for the last several decades, growth mindset. And it's this idea that uh, you can either have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And unfortunately, most of the world has a fixed mindset. They just think that they're either good or bad at something. I'm a good writer. Uh, I'm bad at math. Or I'm, you know, so they think it's innate. It was kind of God-given. While a growth mindset person says, well, if I keep working on something enough and if I really own it, I can eventually get to whatever I, I need to get to. And her research has shown that, like, if you do growth mindset interventions, and there's another researcher, Angela Duckworth, at University of Pennsylvania around grit and perseverance, and they do these, you know, you would think almost superficial interventions where they will just tell the student that, uh, you know, when you make a mistake, that's when your brain grows. Or they would do a little intervention about, and it has all sorts of implications uh, for, the, for the rest of their, so it's, I think it's part of owning, the part, part of the reason why people don't own things and, is because they're, they're afraid of, struggling and failing and then they kind of judge themselves. So I think, I think that's probably one aspect. I think the other aspect of it that's happening for a lot of high school students is that we, we kind of over schedule their time uh, so they have, there's no breathing room and that time is literally, you know, like they have six different teachers saying do this tonight, do that tonight, do that tonight. They're just so tired just doing busy work all night that they, they don't have time, they don't have space to kind of uh, 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 start, start, start to own things. But I think this, you know, this growth mindset stuff, I was, when I first started, I was like, that's interesting. We've even run some experiments on Khan Academy. We're always running experiments to see what works and we've done some growth mind ex mindset experiments and they did work. And, you know, very recently when, while I was working with my son to teach him how to read, and he was struggling with words, and I could see that he was getting a little discouraged. I, I literally, I told him, you, you know, right when you're struggling is when your brain grows. And, and actually, I went a little further. I was like, and I think I saw your brain grow. <laughs> and, and, and now, I mean, it, it's, I, it's um, I mean, I don't know if I should share the secret because it's a competitive world, but it, this, but, but uh, just, just last night, he, he, like, he like, you know, struggled through a couple of words in the book, and he's like, I struggled through seven words. Did, did my brain grow? And I was like, I think it did. He's like, oh, good. And then, and so I think it's, you know, anyway, it's, uh, I think there's something there, but, you know, there's obviously not a lot of silver bullet. So um, first I would like to make a comment, and thank you for what you're doing. Um, you made a comment about your cousin having common questions. Mm -hmm and how just working over those common questions will bridge the gap. And I realized the power of having someone who's educated in the life of a young student to be able to help them navigate that. Um, for many students from communities that, that I come from don't have that. No. And so um, one of the things when I listen to your talk and when I listen to your TED talk, it helps me to realize how transformative and revolutionary what you're creating here is. Um, in order to democratize education and increase access to quality education. So I'm really excited about that. I was just talking to a couple of my colleagues today about how I want to work and do research on equity, equity issues in education, you know, especially in under-resourced, underserved areas. So I really appreciate the tools that you're, you're presenting here. So I want to thank you, that's one thing. Okay. And then the second thing is my question. Um, I, you mentioned something about the charter school in Oakland and how that's a tool and how it improved student performance in that charter school. Is there anything in your business plan or in your future plans for expanding or reaching out to underserved, under-resourced communities or school districts? Because I believe that education shouldn't depend on your zip code. Yeah. And it seems like you have that same philosophy. Shouldn't depend on your zip code, shouldn't yeah. depend on your parents' income, but rather it should be free and for all. Yeah. And so I was wondering if there's anything within your plan or in the scope of your project to uh, reach those demographics. Yeah, no, absolutely. No. And those are good points. I mean, we even see it in the data on our site is if, if you are on Khan Academy and you have a coach, so this could be a parent or it could be a teacher or it could be just a cousin, uh, you are 50% you're, you are, you are more engaged than a student without a coach. So it's very important. And it could be someone who has a background and you know, who's educated and all that, but it, sometimes it's literally just having an adult, someone who cares, someone who takes interest. That's probably 90% of it, someone who takes interest in what you're doing. In, in terms of reaching, you know, and, and, and this is actually something obviously very close to our heart. This is in our mission statement, to reach anyone anywhere. I think you know, the, the unfortunate, well, the reality of today is 
we are dependent on someone having access to broadband or a decent internet connection and, and a computer. And right now, 70% of the developed world has it, um, and 30% and doesn't, and the rest of the world is the other way around. 30% have it, 70% don't. And the unfortunate thing is even in the US, the 30% who don't are the exact people who could benefit the most from it. Um, so we're exploring ways that we can get more outreach where, 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 where you know, whenever I meet anyone in government or whatever, I was like, and they say, what can we do? I was like, just help build awareness. This is the easiest thing. You know, tell your constituents, this thing exists. It is free. You can use it. Uh, we're also always eager to figure out who can we partner with. If you can't have access at home, can, uh, are there after school programs, boys and girls clubs, libraries where, where kids can access it? Uh, so it's something we're exploring. And you know, I don't think there's an easy solution to it tomorrow. Uh, but I think over the next five, ten years, as you know, I think in ten years, every TV is essentially going to be a, a, a computation device. And so at that point, at least in the US, we'll, we'll be able to have much deeper penetration. So access is part of it, not going to get solved overnight. And the other part of it is, yes, how do we build mentorship, uh, kind of a network of mentors? Uh, and, and I think that's going to be partners with like Boys and Girls Club and the folks like that. So please join me in thanking Salman Khan. I've been asked to make predictions for the year 2060 or 50 years in the future. And I thought I would focus this video on things that I feel uh, pretty good about or things that I feel are close to, to, to my heart and hopefully things that things like the Khan Academy might be able to bring about. So the first big change I expect in the next 50 years, and I actually don't think it'll take 50 years for it to happen, it'll probably happen fairly quickly over the next 10 years, is that the classroom model fundamentally changes. So classroom, different. And it's going to change from a model like this. And not all classrooms look like this. There are already classrooms that are exploring different types of ways for students to interact with each other and with the professor. But still, in most classrooms of the world, especially if you take the introductory courses at most universities, you'll see something like this. You'll see a, a, a professor lecturing in some way and a bunch of students sitting in rows taking notes, and then they'll take an exam at the end of the term. In probably, frankly, 10 years, this is going to go away completely go away. You won't have people passively sitting in lecture halls taking notes. So we're going to move from a passive model, a passive taking lectures completely, and this is already happening to a certain degree, completely to an active, active, I would call it discovery, discovery and creative model. So the classroom of the future will look something much more like this. In fact, you might not even call it a classroom. You would call it an, uh, a room or some type of project room or something like that. And the general idea is right now all of these resources are, are, are spent for people to passively get, get information from a professor. When that is necessary, and there will be times where you want to learn a little bit of what someone else discovered about calculus or quantum physics or anything like that, that'll be at your own time, at your own pace, and we can pretend like that's happening to this gentleman right over there, and maybe he's even able to practice some of those core skills. But a bulk of the time will be spent doing this. We'll be doing building things, creating things, exploring things. And it doesn't just have to be science and technology. These people look like they're building some type of a robot. It could be, it could be a, a painting a picture or composing a, a, a sonata or, or choreographing a dance. Whatever it might be, it's going to be much more active, uh, discovery-based, and creative. And actually, one, I think this is going to happen technologically because a lot of the stuff that's happening in this, in this, fa in this model right over here can, happen, can, can, can start to happen a little bit more efficiently through this model, so it frees up time for this. But it's also going to be a social imperative that it happens. If you rewind a few hundred years, and actually you don't even have to rewind that far, the bulk of society, the bulk of society was kind of involved in, I'll call it physical labor. Physical, physical labor. You had a smaller fraction that was involved in mental labor. So I'll call this mental labor, sometimes white collar jobs. Mental labor, something like filling out your taxes. That is mental labor. 
and you had a very small percentage of society, so this is kind of historically, and I'm, I'm even overstating what it is, a very small percentage of society spent in kind of innovation, creativity, art, things like that. So art, art, innovation, true science, true pushing the frontiers of the human experience and human understanding forward. Now, as you get more and more technology, technology, especially with the Industrial Revolution, started to automate a lot of this, and it also made the pie bigger. And so when you have a kind of an industrial society, what happened is, is the, ne the necessity for physical labor went down. So you had a smaller percentage of the population that needed to do physical labor. The mental labor actually grew, so more people can now be involved in things like mental labor. And obviously even automation is, is handling some of that as well. But you've freed up more people to do mental labor and you've definitely freed up a good bit more of resources and people that can now do the, the, the frontier pushing the envelope, the art, the innovation, the creativity. Now, if we fast forward to the year 2060, I think this is going to become an extreme form where almost no physical labor is necessarily required. People might like to do it for exercise. So this part right over here is going to be very, very, very small, especially in developed countries. And hopefully by 2060, most countries will be developed. Even the mental labor is going to be taken over more and more by automation. So a lot of this is going to be automated. So you're going to need less people doing traditional mental labor tasks, filling out paperwork, uh, uh, filling out your taxes, things like that. And it's going to free up a lot of wealth and a lot of resources and a lot of people's hours to do truly artful, creative, innovative things. And so the bulk of society, I think by 2060, if things go well, will be over here. We'll be in this kind of creative class. This is where most people will sit. So it's actually an imperative that our classrooms, one, the tools are, are happening to make it possible, to make it feasible. But not only that, but it's an imperative if society really is moving in this direction, and I think it is, so that we have as many people as possible that can do this research and development, that can do truly creative activity. Now, a corollary to this idea that the classroom will be different, that people will be working self-paced, they'll be spending a lot more time working on projects, is that instead of our credentials being, for the most part, seat time based, so right now our credentials, and it's not 100% seat time, but to a large degree, most people, you, you spend 12, or actually 13 years in K through 12, so that's 13 years, and then if you get a college degree, it's expected it's going to be another four years four years. And there are some people who are able to tweak this, skip a grade here or there, but for the most part, the bulk of people do 13 years and then four years. And then what the variable is, is how well you actually achieved, uh, how well you actually understood your the material. So the variable, so this thing is relatively fixed. This thing is fixed. And then the variable is your level of achievement. Is your level of achievement. Achievement, forgot an E. Achievement. And this right over here is variable. So some people go through the system with straight A's. They've really understood everything, or hopefully they've understood everything if they got straight A's. Some people have B's, some people get C's. And that's why we have something called a grade point average. It shows that variation in achievement, uh, even though everyone is kind of in this fixed seat time. What we're going to transition to, especially once everyone is learning at their own pace, they don't have to kind of move together lockstep in these classrooms, is you're going to go to an achievement-based. It's going to be an achievement-based model where there are achievements that you are trying to get to, and they can be multiple things. Part of the achievements could be skills like maybe calculus or, or being able to read music, read music, or being able to, I don't know, understand quantum physics. These would all be achievements, but you decide how you will learn to, to master these core concepts. So it won't be based on you have to spend 13 years and then four years going into debt to do it. You could go to a formal institution to learn some of this stuff, or you could learn it however you see fit. You might be able to be an apprentice with someone and then eventually, and then eventually show that you know quantum physics very well. And I could imagine these achievements would be far more rigorous than the assessments that are being given right now. They could be oral examinations. They could be practical examinations. They could be contingent upon you building or applying some of this information. But what's interesting about this is now the seat time, the time is variable. So now, let me write this. The time is now the variable. 
You can do this whenever, wherever, however long it takes. You could even revisit things when you're 40 or 50. There won't be any artificial stopping point that you are 22, you're a college grad, now you will not learn new things anymore. And what's fixed, and I won't call it fixed because you can always get more and more achievements, but the achievements will be at a high standard. It's a fixed high standard. So that if you get this reading music achievement, you really do know how to read music, which is different than some of the achievements. If I get a C in a calculus class, it's not clear that I actually do understand calculus. In fact, it's not even true, necessarily true if I got an A in a calculus class, whether I definitely understand calculus. So fixed high, fixed high standards. And I imagine that the only credentials won't just be these kind of subject-based credentials, the most important part. Because remember, the emphasis here is on the creative, on the projects. And in creative fields, your real transcript is not your GPA. Your real transcript is your portfolio of projects, portfolio of work that you've done. So people will get things like this to show that, they've, uh, that they understand specific domains. But the most important part of the transcript of the future will be people's achievements. Or I should say, they're projects. So you know, maybe I made a robot that can uh, maybe make make toast of some kind. Maybe I've maybe I've painted a picture. So here's a picture. Maybe I've written a piece of software that does something interesting. So some software. So what employers and other people will really care about isn't just your GPA or how much time you spent in a lecture hall. They'll say, show me the stuff that you have actually built, that you've actually that shows that you are that you are really in this creative class, that you could start from scratch and create something new and novel. And I also imagine because we'll be getting so much data while people are actually working on working on getting some of their core skills that you won't just even have these do you know calculus do you know quantum physics you'll also have metrics how hard working were you how how well did you persevere especially maybe when you failed first these would be I, I think considered to be good things and on top of that you could start to measure how how well did you help others so that could be another achievement helping helping others when you virtually tutor people or physically tutor people they rate you and they say wow that person really did help me and we can even look at the data to see whether you had a, stati a statistically significant impact on their results now the next corollary with this different classroom and this achievement based learning is i think the role of the teacher will change dramatically and i think it'll be in a very powerful way so the role of the teacher rather than being a lecturer Rather than being a lecturer and often giving similar lectures from year to year and always going at the same pace, the teacher will now be a coach or a mentor. And anyone who's ever seen a great football or basketball coach will tell you that a great coach or mentor is a very rich, a very rich and important role. And so I think that the role of the teacher will go up, will go up dramatically. And it actually won't even be an isolated profession anymore. Right now in a, t in a traditional classroom, because it's lecture based, you have a classroom of 20, 25, 30 students, another classroom of 20, 25, 30 students, another classroom of 20, 25, 30 students. And in each of them, you'll have a teacher. In each of them, you have a teacher, often at the front of the classroom, running class, lecturing in some way. Because every student is now working at their own pace at their own time, and the teachers are now spending most of their time interacting with students, I could imagine a world where why have these walls between classrooms? Why not just have one larger classroom? Now it's 70, 75, 90 students, and all three teachers, all three teachers work together. And so it becomes it, the teachers aren't isolated in their rooms. They're all able to tag team and play to each other's strengths. And the students will have the benefit, instead of having the benefit of one, one, uh, I guess, experience base and knowledge set, the students have the experience base of all of these teachers. And not only that, they'll also be tutoring each other. So in this model, in this model, it's all going from the teacher to the student, from the teacher to students. Here it's going from teachers to multiple students, teachers from multiple students, and from students to students, and maybe even students to teachers. So it's going from it's it's going from peer to peer and multiple te stu teachers to multiple peers. And I think in this type of a model because the teacher is going to become that much more valuable because now it is all interactive. There is no more passive lecture. There is no giving the same lecture every year. I think that the 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 profession of teaching will become even more prestigious. So my big 
And I'm saying 2060, but I think this is going to happen over the next 10 to 15 years. So I think by 2020 or 2025, you're going to have the teaching profession is going to be, go, become at parity with professions like medicine or law or engineering in terms of how much a teacher can make and how they are valued by society. So I predict in this reality, teachers based on today's money, if you inflation adjusted, are going to make 150,000 to 200,000 per year. And for any of those who say, wait, where's the money for $150,000 to $200,000 per year? You just should realize that right now, most states, even if you just focus on public schools, are spending on the order of $10,000 a student. They're spending $10,000 per student. And even if you had a 25 to one student to teacher ratio, that means that you have, so if you multiply it by 25 students, that means you have $250,000 $250,000 for the teacher and the facilities and any other technology. And all, I'm all, all I'm arguing for is that the master teachers, the ones that are really pushing the envelope here, should get a bulk of these resources as opposed to layers of bureaucracy and whatever else. Now the last prediction I'll make related to education right over here, and it's related to all of this, is because, because the actual cost of delivering a lot of the core material, a lot of the core practice over here, is going to go close to zero because you'll really just need an internet connection and, and maybe your peers who are also learning alongside of you and it'll become even better if you have a, a, a really amazing experienced professional teacher with you. But my the, the fourth part of it is I believe we're going to get to a 99% global literacy rate. And we're already close to this in much of the developed world, but in the developing world, it's significantly below this. And obviously you can imagine if we do get to this type of a literacy rate, what that means for healthcare, what that means for population, what that means for economic growth, what that means for wars, I think this is a, it's, it's a very, very, very positive thing. And coinciding with this idea that students around the world are able to get access to a world-class education, that it's like having clean drinking water or electricity, I think you start getting closer to a global meritocracy where that student who right now, she might just be the daughter of, of, of beggars in some part of the developed world, but because she has access to this material and she can develop herself and, and people will know how she's developing herself because all of the data is being logged, we can say, wow, that she has a potential to really be one of the leaders in this creative class. She has a potential to, to, to find the cure for cancer or find a, a, a new way of doing X, Y, or Z. And so you really can give these students all over the world, all over the world, the opportunities that they, that they really should have. And for, hopefully there will be a ton of opportunities because the pie will have gotten so much bigger that we can support a lot of these creative endeavors.